In the first section of chapter 10, we were looking at the liquid state. Now we're going to look at um, what happens when a substance changes um, state. And then eventually we're going to look at the solid state. So what we're looking at in um, section 10.3 are phase transitions. How a substance moves from being a solid to a liquid and then ultimately a gas. So looking at the transition from uh, liquid to ga gas, um, what we're going to be focusing on is a process that's known as evaporation. And it's important to recognize that evaporation occurs from the surface of the liquid and that the particles that will be evaporating, that will be leaving the liquid and entering the gas phase, are those that have the greatest energy. So if a particle has enough energy, it can overcome the attractive forces that are holding it in the liquid um, state and it can leave and return to and, and enter into the gas phase. So what happens is that the highest energy particles will end up evaporating and then what um, remains will be the lower energy particles. So this has some important consequences. What it indicates is that um, evaporation will occur faster at higher temperatures because more particles will have enough energy to escape the surface. Because evaporation results in the loss of the most energetic particles, um, what this does is it lowers the average kin kinetic energy of the liquid that remains, right? You keep losing all of your high energy particles and so yeah, that's what's going to happen. The kinetic energy of what remains lowers. What does the kinetic energy of a liquid represent? Well, it represents its temperature. So as evaporation occurs, the temperature of the remaining liquid will lower and lower and lower because it keeps losing energy. And this is the principle behind evaporative cooling. And that's one of the main ways that creatures like ourselves that sweat or dogs that pant lower or control their body temperature. So evaporation will occur even when we are below the temperature where we would normally expect boiling to occur. So the, the um, molecules or the atoms that are found above a liquid at a temperature less than where we would expect that substance to be a gas that is less than at the boiling point are referred to not as gas phase, um, not as the gas phase, but as the vapor phase. So the vapor is just, is just the gas at a temperature lower than the boiling point of the liquid. So it's kind of just a little subtle distinction. Now if you take a liquid and you put it into a container and then you seal that container, what you'll find is that the amount of vapor will initially increase. However, over time, you'll eventually get to a point where the amount of liquid and the amount of vapor remains constant. You will achieve a state what is of what is referred to as physical equilibrium between the liquid and the vapor. And what that means is that particles from the vapor are re-entering the liquid just as quickly as particles from the liquid are entering into the vapor. And the net result is that the amount of liquid and vapor remains constant. So this is kind of like and what happens with a parking lot, right? Initially, the parking lot fills up with cars quite quickly, and then it remains full for the rest of the day. And however, there's a constant, you know, like turnover of the cars because what's happening is as fast as cars are entering, they are exiting. So it's the same kind of principle as the physical equilibrium that exists in a sealed container of a liquid and its vapor. There's just this kind of back and forth, but if they're happening at the same rates, the amount of liquid and vapor will not change. Okay, so the pressure of the vapor in a sealed container, once physical equilibrium has been achieved, is called the vapor pressure of that liquid, and it's going to depend upon a couple of things, right? It's going to depend very importantly on the attractive forces between particles. And as those forces increase, the vapor pressure will decrease. So as intermolecular forces go up, vapor pressure will go down. If a substance has a high vapor pressure, 
it's often referred to as being volatile. You can often tell if something's volatile because you might be able to smell it, right? Because what you're detecting is the vapor that is hitting your olfactory sensors in your nose. Okay, so the vapor pressure is a measure of the extent of intermolecular forces in our sample. Okay. The other thing to recognize about the vapor pressure is that it's going to be dependent on the temperature. Remember we said that the rate of evaporation depends on the temperature? Well, the vapor pressure also depends on the temperature and unsurprisingly, as the temperature increases, the vapor pressure increases because we simply we have enough more molecules that have the energy to overcome the attractive intermolecular forces and enter into the vapor. So the vapor pressure of liquids increase with temperature because that increases the average kinetic energy of your particles in your liquid and so therefore more of them have enough um, energy to overcome the intermolecular forces that are holding them in the liquid. Something that's interesting to think about is how evaporation is affected by surface area. Remember that we said that evaporation can only occur from the very surface of our liquid. So what happens when we increase surface area is we create more surface and then there are more particles that can potentially evaporate. And we know this if you take a cup of water and leave it sitting on the bench overnight it's probably not going to all evaporate but if you take the same water and you just pour it on the ground and it spreads out into a very thin layer with a large amount of surface area then it's going to evaporate a lot quicker and it's purely because there is more surface area so as we described previously the vapor pressure of a liquid increases with increasing temperature. So as temperature goes up, the vapor pressure goes up. We also notice that as intermolecular forces go up, vapor pressure goes down. So let's have a look at a series of sort of compounds and think about their intermolecular forces and what their vapor pressure is at a different, uh, at particular pressures. So N octane here is nonpolar. It's just a hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbons in general are nonpolar. And bromine is nonpolar because it's two identical atoms. It might not be immediately obvious, but diethyl ether is also nonpolar. So these guys only have dispersion forces between their particles. And now let's look a little bit further and think about what's going to have who's going to have the biggest dispersion forces. So N octane is a really long flat molecule. So you would expect it to have, you know, some fairly um, significant dispersion forces. It looks like it's like a chain of like eight carbon atoms and they're all in a line. So this one here, London forces are going to be strong. Okay. There we go. So this is N octane, by the way. It's that one there, N octane. Okay. Now we've got um, diethyl ether and bromine. And bromine is actually got a really high molecular weight. So bromine, we would expect to have some, you know, modest London forces. Yeah, it's always surprising the, um, the molar mass of bromine. So one bromine, I'm just looking it up now, is um, 79.9. So this is going to be like a molar mass of just shy of 160 grams per mole. Now diethyl ether has the lowest molar mass of these three nonpolar molecules. So it has the London forces that are the least. And so there's our diethyl ether and there's our bromine. Okay, so here's an octane. We can see that any at any um, given um, vapor pressure, so say we have a vapor pressure of 300 millimeters of mercury, you have to raise that to get to that vapor pressure. You have to go to a lot higher temperature for the n octane than what you do for either the bromine or the diethyl ether. You see that? Right. 
So as the intermolecular forces increase, you have to heat it up more to get the same vapor pressure. All right, so now let's have a look at the one, the other um, three there, and they have the quality, those three have the quality that they have much stronger intermolecular forces, they can all hydrogen bond. And you might have seen some of these molecules before, some of them are gonna be familiar to you. So we've got ethanol here, we've got water, and we've got ethylene glycol. Now ethylene glycol has a lot of opportunity because it's got these two OH groups for hydrogen bonding, it's also got a fairly decent molar mass. So I would expect that this is going to have the strongest intermolecular forces, and it does, right? And you can see that if I want to get that 300 millimeters of mercury vapor pressure, I have to heat that guy up the most, right? Now, water has a molar mass of about 18.02 grams per mole, and it has sort of similar hydrogen bonding um, capacity as ethanol. Now, ethanol has a uh, molar mass, I don't quite know where it is, I can quickly figure it out. So two times 12 plus 16 plus six, it's gonna molar mass is gonna be around about 46. So it's gonna have bigger dispersion forces than water, and it has the same um, um, opportunity for hydrogen bonding. It has the two lone pairs there on the oxygen. So these are gonna have kind of similar hydrogen bonding capacity, but the ethanol has a um, larger molar mass. So let's see, what do we see here? We see the water, doo -doo 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 -doo. there it is. You have to heat it up to about 75 degrees to get 300 millimeters of mercury um, vapor pressure, whereas the ethanol, you heat it up to, it's, it's similar, right? You heat it up to about 55 degrees to get a 300 millimeter um, vapor pressure there. So these guys are quite similar. It seems that because you've got two hydrogen atoms here, it makes hydrogen bonding uh, more probable. That offsets the difference in molar mass between those two. So what we see is as the intermolecular forces increase, the vapor pressure at a given temperature decreases, right? So that's, that's what's going on there. Now there is something that um, we want to talk about as far as um, the uh, temperature and the vapor pressure is concerned. And there's a special temperature called the normal boiling point. And the normal boiling point is when the vapor pressure is equal to one atmosphere. So here it is here, 760 millimeters of mercury. And these are all of the normal boiling points for those substances. And what you want to recognize is that boiling point increases as intermolecular forces increase. Okay. So getting all sort of mathematical, what you see is that for a pure substance that there is a linear relationship between the log of the vapor pressure and the inverse of the temperature when you express the temperature in Kelvin. So if you plot log of P against one on T, you get a straight line. And you always get a straight line with a negative slope. Okay, it's always gonna be a negative slope. The exact mathematical relationship is this. It says that log P, which is our Y, is equal to AX plus B, and so y is our log of our vapor pressure, and x is one on t. And then what is a equal? A is the delta h of vaporization on R, and then our b is just some kind of constant. Okay, so the log of the vapor pressure is equal to minus delta h on R, multiplied by one on t plus c. The one on t needs to be in Kelvin, and this is the enthalpy of vaporization. It's gonna be expressed in joules per mole. And then that's your ideal gas constant, which is 8.314 joules per mole per degree Kelvin. Okay, so that's kind of clunky. 
that's sort of like awkward. What the hell does this C thing mean? And there's this stray constant there. And unless we're going to make a graph, this isn't particularly useful. So there is a sort of, um, you know, way of making this more useful for this is what's referred to as the slope intercept form of an equation. And this particular equation is called the Klaus's Clapeyron equation. What we can see is, is that if I bring this term over to the left hand side, I would end up with an expression for C. And that expression would hold for any combination of <coughs> pressure and temperature. It would always equal C. So what I do is consider that I have two temperatures. Then I could write log of P at temperature 1 plus delta H vaporization on R multiplied by 1 on T. Or 1 on T1 would be equal to C. And then that would also be equal to log of the pressure at temperature 2 plus delta H vaporization on R multiplied by 1 on temperature 2. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract one of these things um, from the other. Okay, so when I do that, I'm going to say that log, um, so I'm just going to kind of reorganize this. I'm just going to bring this term over here, and kind of this term over here, basically collecting uh, similar terms. So we've got log P at temperature 1 minus log of P at temperature 2, and then that's going to be equal to delta H on R multiplied by 1 on T2 minus delta H on R multiplied by 1 on T1. Now, keeping in mind that log of A minus log of B is equal to log of A on B, we can write this in this form, which is the two-point form of the Clausius Clapeyron, which is the most common way that we're going to use it. So this is the equation that we'll be using. There are some things to keep in mind that we really, really want to be aware of as we move through. Now, I will give a little bit of a, um, a warning about there's an alternate way that some people will write this, and, but it is equivalent. Okay, so here's an example problem using the Klaus's Clapeyron. Please, 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 if you can, use the solver so you don't have to worry about doing algebra and then we'll now we'll just work through it. So it says at a temperature of 126 degrees Celsius, I'm paying attention, wherever I see degrees Celsius, I'm almost always going to have to um, convert it. C8H18, that's an octane, has a vapor pressure of 760 torr. So they're telling you the boiling point, right? They're telling you the normal boiling point is 126 degrees Celsius because the normal boiling point is when the vapor pressure equals 760 torr. It says given delta H vaporization is 39.07 kilojoules per mole and I'm being aware here remember I said you have to turn this into joules per mole for n oct uh, given that delta H vaporization equals 39.07 kilojoules per mole for n octane what is its vapor pressure at 25 and again I'm thinking about turning that into Kelvin. So what have I got I've got two temperatures, T1, T2, T1, and T2. I've got two, I've got one pressure, and I want to get the second one, and I've got the delta H vaporization. Classic Clausius Caperon. All right, so T1, I can put that as 126, P1, 760 Tor. T2, 25 degrees Celsius. P2, it's going to be some number less than 760 Tor, but that's what I'm solving for, that guy. Delta H vaporization, 39.07 kilojoules per mole. So here's the two-point form of the Klaus's Clapeyron, and now I've just got to solve. I've got to keep my units straight. My pressure units, it doesn't matter what I use for them, but they must be the same top and bottom. So natural logarithm of 760 on 
x and x is what I'm solving for is equal to my delta acre vaporization expressed in joules 39.07 and then to get rid of the kilojoules times 10 to the 3 joules divided by r 8.314 joules per mole per degree Kelvin multiplied by 1 on T2 T2 was 25 degrees Celsius minus 1 on uh, T1 and T1 was 126 degrees Celsius so I do that math and I get to here now I need to get rid of the log so I have to take the anti-log so um, I take the anti-logs of both sides so e to the 3.9998 will be equal to 760 on, on x so that gets me there and then I've just got to solve for x 760 on the 53.9611 14.1 tor and I'm happy because I said it had to be less than 760 so it's looking good now of course if you can use the solver all you have to do is put that into your calculator and then you just hit the solve button and you're done and you avoid all of that stuff so I'm really begging you and um, please have a go at using the solver if your calculator has that feature if you don't know how to use it, um, what I suggest you do is just go to um, YouTube and just search for solver and your particular brand of um, calculator. You'll find, you know, TI-83, TI-84, whatever it might be. You'll find like half a dozen videos pretty quickly um, where people go through it and then just watch one or two and practice a few problems and see if you can figure it out. If you're having immense trouble doing it, then let me know and I'll try and... Um, hook you up with some resources that are going to help you out. Okay, so a few things to take note of when using the Clausius clapeyron equation. Temperatures need to be in K. Your enthalpy of vaporization needs to be in joules per mole, but very commonly they're going to give it to you in kilojoules per mole, so you've got to make sure you times it by 10 to the 3 to get rid of that. You have to use the value of R that has appropriate units, and that's going to be this value here. Your two pressures, they need to have the same units. It doesn't matter whether it's millimeters of mercury, pascals, ATM, tor, or whatever. They just both got to have the same units. Okay, and whatever you put in is what you're going to get out. Okay, so that's really it. You just got to be a little bit careful. I mentioned something else. Sometimes people rewrite Klaus's Clapper on with a minus sign out the front of the second term and flip the order of the temperatures. It doesn't matter that expre the expression that I've written here is equivalent to the one that I gave earlier on in the PowerPoints. Okay, so something to keep in mind is that when we are talking about and changes of state, it's very important to recognize that if a process is exothermic or energy releasing in one direction, it will be endothermic in the other direction. And when we think about phase changes, this becomes really kind of obvious. If I want to go from a solid to a liquid, that is, I want to melt something, I have to put heat in. But if I want to go from a liquid to a solid, that's what we call freezing, obviously I have to take heat out. So the um, so these things, you know, you don't need to know the enthalpy for melting and the enthalpy of freezing. You only need to know one of them because the other will just be the same numerical value with the opposite sign. So you want to keep that in mind. But sometimes they only give you one of these enthalpies, but you can always get the other one by just um, reversing the sign. Okay, there are some common enthalpies associated with phase changes that have common names. One is called the heat of fusion, enthalpy of fusion, and that's the enthalpy change that is associated with melting one mole of a substance. So when people are talking about enthalpy of fusion, that's what they're talking about. So for example, taking one mole of solid sodium chloride and turning it into a mole of liquid sodium chloride. The other commonly um, stated enthalpy value that we see associated with phase changes is the heat of vaporization, and that's just defined as um, the enthalpy change that accompanies taking one mole of a liquid 
and turning it into one mole of the gas phase substance. So thinking about this, you realize that enthalpy of fusion, which is all about melting, that's going to be a heat in process, right? So enthalpies of fusion are always going to be positive. And then enthalpies of vaporization, that's the one that's associated with evaporation. And again, that's going to be a heat in process. So again, that will be positive. So both of these processes you would expect to be endothermic every single time. It takes energy to melt something or to evaporate it. Okay, another enthalpy change associated with phase changes that we often see is the enthalpy or the heat of sublimation. And that's the enthalpy change that's associated with taking one mole of a solid substance and turning it into one mole of the gas phase substance. And again, you would expect that, um, that this guy would be endothermic. You're going to go from a solid all the way to a gas that is most definitely going to be a heat in process. So you, the enthalpy change associated with this will be positive. It's an endothermic process. So you can see that all of three of these common enthalpies are defined to be positive numbers and it just kind of keeps it simple that way. So if you're solving for an enthalpy of fusion an enthalpy of vaporization or an enthalpy of sublimation, you want to make sure that you end up with a positive number at the end. Okay, so we can, of course, like sort of, you know, flip this around, you know. So if I am I'm looking at a process where um, there is condensation of a liquid, that is a, um, a vapor is becoming a liquid, then that's going to be exothermic, right? It's going to result in a release of energy. So when water vapor condenses, like steam condenses on your hand, not only do you get burnt because the steam is hot, you also get burnt because there's a release of energy as the steam turns into liquid water. When we freeze a substance, when we go from a liquid to a solid, that's also exothermic. We have to take energy out of the system, and you can see that there, right? Now, where do we get these values from? Well, you know, we look them up in tables and we can even calculate them by doing Hess's law type calculations and using enthalpies of formations if we need to. When we reverse a process, say instead of condensation, we look at evaporation, instead of freezing, we look at melting. Remember that the size of the enthalpy change will be the same, but there'll just be an opposite sign, okay? So sublimation is the process where a solid um, changes to the vapor phase without going through the liquid. We talked about this before. We would expect it to be endothermic. So delta H sub is going to be greater than zero. There is also the process where a substance goes from the gas directly to the solid, and that is called deposition, often used to get a high purity substance and the enthalpy change associated with that will just be equal to the same um, enthalpy change for sublimation, but it'll have the opposite sign. All right, so one of the big things that we're gonna be looking at this week are heating curves, and this is what's gonna form the basis for our lab. So we're gonna look here at the heating curve for pure water. What you do in a heating curve is you plot temperature against heat added and we're going to start really cold we're going to start at minus 40 degrees celsius here so our sample of water is 100 percent solid what we're going to do is we're going to add heat and see what happens to the temperature and what we see is that as we add heat the temperature of our ice rises linearly until we get to zero degrees celsius where melting begins. At zero degrees Celsius, as we add heat, the temperature doesn't change. But what does change is this physical state of our substance. So over here, when we first hit zero, we got 100% solid, and then we keep adding heat, 
and we slowly move we get some liquid forming and slowly that proportion of liquid um, increases 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 until we get to here and then we have a hundred percent liquid and then when we begin to add heat the temperature starts rising linearly again right so while the phase change is occurring we see no increase in the temperature as we add the heat. Once we get to 100 degrees Celsius, which is called the boiling point, the normal boiling point, the temperature remains constant. And the temperature remains constant. Here we've got 100% liquid when we first hit 100 degrees Celsius. And then as we add heat, what happens is we start forming more and more gas and we end up with less and less liquid. And eventually we reach a point where we have 100% gas. And then the temperature starts to rise again. But while the phase change is occurring, the temperature remains constant. So this is very typical to have this, or this is what we will see for every substance. We'll see this like, um, sort of like series of um, lines with a positive slope separated by these horizontal regions for the heating curve of a substance. Okay, so now we're going to kind of dive in and we're going to start looking at the math and how we can figure out exactly how the temperature changes as we add heat to a substance. So as you add heat to your solid sample of water at minus 40, the temperature rises in a way that is dependent upon the heat capacity, the heat, and the amount of sample that we have. And if you remember that Q is equal to amount, which could either be mass or moles, multiplied by the heat capacity, could be either what we call the specific heat capacity or the molar heat capacity, you might need to revise those terms, times by the change in temperature. And that's what this is indicating here. Here they're using the molar heat capacity and the number of moles for the amount. So that's what's happening there. Good. Okay. So in that first little bit here, I'm just going to call this one. That would be the heat that would be required. So we're going to go from minus 40 up to 40. So my delta T there would be 40, wouldn't it? All right. Okay. So what happens once I get to the melting point? Well, when I get the melting point, it begins melting. The fastest molecules leave the solid as liquid. But the temperature remains constant until we've 100% melted our sample. And so for this second step, how much heat do we need to add? I'm going to call this Q2. Well, it's going to be my amount times by my enthalpy of fusion. That's normally going to be expressed in joules or kilojoules per mole. So that's going to be my moles times by my enthalpy of fusion. Remember that fusion is the, um, the enthalpy of fusion is the amount of heat associated with melting one mole of a substance. Okay, so once 100% of my um, substance has been melted, I begin the second phase of adding heat. And what I'm, what's going to happen here is once all the sample is melted, if you add heat, the temperature of the liquid will rise until you get to the boiling point. So as we're adding heat through here, what's going to happen in this third step, it's going to be very similar to what was going on in our first step. The temperature is rising linearly. We know that the temperature change is related to the heat um, added by the same formula. It's the amount times by the heat capacity times by the change in temperature. Now our change in temperature this time is going to be from zero up to a hundred. So it's going to be a hundred degrees. So that can either be the mass or the moles for the amount, depending on whether this is per gram or per mole. We just have to be a little bit careful there. All right. So up that goes there and what happens when it gets to 100 it begins to boil and as we add heat we don't raise the temperature all we do is we kind of drive off the um, it's just used to 
break the connections and allow the substance to some of the substance to enter into the gas phase. So in this fourth part, as he writes three, in the fourth part of the curve here, what's happening is we're melting it, right? And we're going to add heat until the entire thing is melted and the temperature is going to stay at 100 degrees while that's happening. Now we know that the heat required to vaporize one mole of a sample is called the delta H of vaporization. So for our sample, the heat required to complete step four will be our amount times the delta H of vaporization. And if that's given in um, joules per mole, then we'd want our amount to be in moles. You just gotta kind of pay attention to the units. Okay, so once we've done that, we end up with a sample of gas that's at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. And if we continue to add heat at that point, then the temperature of our gas will continue to rise for as long as we add heat to it. And while a phase change is not occurring, as we're adding heat, what's gonna happen is the temperature will rise according to this equation, same as what we had before, amount times by the heat capacity times by the change in temperature. And again, that could be per gram or it could be per mole. And so that's going to determine the units that we have for our amount, which will be either grams or moles. Okay, so we've got five regions of the curve and we've got two different types of equations that we're going to use to calculate the amount of heat that is needed to affect each of the changes. So we're going to end up with amount of heat 1, amount of heat 2, amount of heat 3, amount of heat 4, and amount of heat 5. And if we added all of those together, we'd get the total amount of heat needed to achieve a particular change. So here's an example, and um, it's sort of you know, it's always worth drawing out the little curve and figuring out where you're at. It says how much thermal energy, that's just another word for heat, must be transferred to heat one gram of ice, that's gonna be our amount, right? At a temperature of minus 18, so that's telling you that you're beginning with a solid, until it is a liquid at 25 degrees. So I'm gonna go from about there, I'm gonna heat it up, I'm gonna melt it, and then I'm gonna heat it up a little more, okay? So I'm probably worth marking on there um, a few numbers. I'm gonna heat it up to 25, and I'm starting at minus 18. So I've got three things that I need to be adding together. I've gotta to do Q1, Q2, Q3, in order to solve this problem. So first of all I'm gonna do first thing I'm gonna do is figure out how many moles of water are there in one gram of ice. So number of moles is mass on molar mass, so that's one on 18.02. So I got that many moles of water. Okay. Now I want to figure out what is my change in temperature and that the solid is gonna undergo. And so it's gonna go from minus 18 up to zero. So it's gonna have undergo a change in temperature of 18 degrees Celsius. And then I need to figure out the change in temperature of the liquid and it's gonna go from zero up to 25. So the liquid will change its temperature by 25 degrees Celsius. So I'm getting some info here. I'm going to need the heat capacity of the solid. So I looked that up. There it is in a table. And, and the units are a little wacky there. That should be joules per degree Celsius. Oh. And then I'm also going to need the heat capacity of my liquid to go in here. So I looked that up and I got that. And then I'm going to need the enthalpy of fusion. And I looked that up. So now I kind of have everything that I need to do each of these three um, bits of math here. And so I'm going to do it. So the first one, Q, Q1, number of moles of water, 
a number of moles of ice times by the heat capacity of the ice times by the exchange temperature of the ice there it is then the melting the number of moles of ice multiplied by the enthalpy of fusion of the ice there it is and then my third step the number of moles of ice multiplied by the heat capacity of the liquid got to be careful to make sure you use the correct heat capacity multiplied by the change in temperature of the liquid which it's going from 0 up to 25 so there it is and I put all of that together and I get my answer 475 joules so relatively complicated and you do need to know what you're doing you probably want to practice several of them and be able to do them kind of flawless before you attempt your quiz okay so